Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to close this evening with uh, a panel on, I would say, the macroeconomic and geopolitical environment within which the fund industry will develop in the year 2021. And we will be talking about the United Kingdom, I would say the new United Kingdom outside of the legal framework and uh, the single market of the European Union on the one hand, and a new administration of the President Joe Biden that just started its work in the United States. And as the fund industry is global, as the Luxembourg is global, and as we believe very much in cross-border activities, so is the panel tonight, which is very international indeed. And therefore, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you the co-panelist, His Excellency John Marshall, the British ambassador to Luxembourg. He has been on many panels on Brexit, but now, you know, Brexit is there, and we have to see where the future lies for the United Kingdom and the relationship with other financial centers. Natalie Westerbarki, director and head of EU public policy at Fidelity International. Jervis Smith, the county managing director of uh, Vistra, serving the corporate and uh, fund industry, by the way, a British national. And um, on the other side of this uh, table, we have Casey Mace, the Deputy Chief of Mission of the United States. The ambassador left Luxembourg as is customary in the American system when you have political appointees as ambassadors. And uh, Casey Mace is now the head of the Luxembourg at the US Embassy in Luxembourg until the appointment of a new ambassador by President uh, Biden. 2021 is, of course, mm -hmm. a quite important year as it affects by the events that I just mentioned, Brexit on the one hand, the US presidential elections, two of the largest financial centers outside of Europe, the US and London. Of course, the UK is still in Europe, but it's no longer in the European Union. And in the US, of course, as the leading economy, everything that happens there has an impact on the rest of the uh, world economy, of course. For us, and um, as you know, I probably were more often on parents where I was asked questions than asking questions to others. <laughs> Let me set the scene here a little bit. I think that after five years in the US where we had a quite, um, yes, unusual uh, presidency with uh, certainly quite a number of unpresidential tweets. From a European perspective, we will now certainly see an administration that will, on the one hand, be pro-European. We saw President Lee acted as vice president. But on the other hand, probably financial services will play less of a role as it has in the first time when Joe Biden was uh, vice president under President Obama. Because at that time, when he started his work, mm -hmm. of course, that was, the, uh, that was the financial crisis. Obama and Biden started, as you remember, in 2009. And obviously, financial services were at the forefront of the political agenda. It will be interesting to see what role financial services, financial regulation will play during the five years to come. And of course, that's important for the rest of the world because uh, there is a, usually a global regulatory agenda. We have to see where everybody stands on that. The US on the one hand, the UK and the EU. From my perspective, Joe Biden is more a um, mainstream Democrat when it comes to uh, financial services. And um, I think the appointment uh, of uh, the first members of the cabinet, in particular those in charge of um, economic affairs, show that they, we can build on what we have seen in uh, the past. There are a lot of faces that uh, we know from previous uh, administrations, and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, 
the deputy chief of mission of the U.S. Embassy telling us a little bit what his impression is from what the new administration will do in these uh, areas. Obviously there, the UK will be as much a question mark than the new US administration. Because the UK, we know it for a very long time, but we knew the UK the last 50 years as a member of the European Union, alongside Luxembourg and the other members of the European Union. A new chapter started last January when the UK officially left the EU, but it's only since January 1st this year that the legal framework, all these uh, rules that we had decided together over the past 50 years will no longer apply in the uh, United Kingdom. And um, it is therefore a new path that we will embark upon uh, together. I must say that, uh, like many probably in the fund industry, we were happy to see that at the end of last year, after long and difficult negotiations, but I expected them to be long and difficult, so it was not that much of a surprise, but still it was positive, I think, that um, trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and um, the United Kingdom was uh, concluded. That creates a positive atmosphere for the future. However, when you look at what is in it for financial services, you can see that it's almost a hard Brexit mm -hmm. because there's almost nothing in it, as is customary, by the way, for trade uh, agreements. And therefore, I think this trade and cooperation agreement is, in my view, for financial services, merely a platform to build uh, the future. In particular, mm -hmm. when you look at this joint declaration, which is a non-binding joint declaration that, um, uh, that says that in terms of uh, areas related to financial services, there will be a structured dialogue and a cooperation on how equivalence might or might not be decided. The fact, however, is that as of today, there is no direct link anymore, legal link between the UK and uh, the European Union of Financial Services. The UK is a third country like the US. No equivalence has been granted in the 28 areas where equivalence can be granted unilaterally by the European Commission, by the European Union. And uh, moreover, the UK firms have no passport anymore to sell and provide their services into the huge single market <clears throat> of the European Union. So I think that if I were British, and if I would work in the financial services industry, I would be a little bit surprised and a little bit sad that I had lost this access, access to the single European market. But that's, of course, a continental view, maybe. And therefore, I would uh, start this debate by um, asking you, Ambassador Marshall, what is your assessment of this uh, agreement uh, from the UK perspective. I think, as I said, from a European perspective, I think we are happy to have the agreement, but there's very little in it for financial services and therefore a big question mark on how that will work. How do you see it from the UK perspective, John? Well, as you say, the UK and the EU are now beginning a, a new chapter. And um, it's good news that we begin this new chapter in our relationship with an agreement. <laughs> and remembering how many people were saying that, you know, it was an impossible task to do it uh, in such a short period of time, that, it, you know, agreements of this sort take five, ten years to negotiate. I think that, you know, it really is to the credit of the two chief negotiators, of Michel Barnier uh, and David Frost, and their teams, that um, they achieved so much in a, in a short, short period of time. Uh, as you say, the negotiations were uh, tough, I mean, we too expected them to be tough. Uh, the negotiations also went to the wire. That's what negotiations do. Uh, that was expected. I mean, personally, perhaps I thought the wire might have come slightly earlier in December, but um, uh, that's because I'm not a negotiator and uh, they, uh, they wanted to eke out a few, more, a few more days. But, you know, fortunately on the 24th of, of December, we... Um, we got this agreement, and it's an agreement which I think both sides are pleased with. Uh, you know, from the EU's point of view, it 
the agreement protects the integrity of the single market, which is one of the key objectives they went into the negotiations with. Uh, from our point of view, uh, it also achieves um, our goals in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, we're not bound into EU law, that we retain the right to regulate in whatever sector it might be, that we there's no role for the for ECJ um, in the in the agreement, um, and uh, in many ways the agreement is um, uh, is goes well beyond many many other free trade agreements, particularly obviously on the good side, and to the extent that um, it's a zero tariff, uh, zero quota agreement. Uh, the agreement obviously isn't just a, a trade agreement. There are all sorts of different elements uh, within it. And in a number of other respects, it goes way beyond what is normal in a, in a free trade agreement, particularly, for example, in the area of uh, internal security, uh, where there's a very good um, chapter. Um, so we can be confident that, you know, the uh, security of our citizens uh, has been has been protected. In other areas of the agreement, it's much more based on, on precedent and the sorts of things that normally go into free trade agreements, as you, as you said. Um, and, you know, we went into these negotiations basically asking uh, in many areas for the agreement to be based on precedent. Um, and so in services, it's a fairly, a fairly, standard, um, fairly standard text. So when it comes to financial services, I mean, you described what's in the agreement as a platform, and I think that's a, uh, a, good, um, a good image, uh, a platform that provides some sort of certainty and on which we can, can build. And as you say, uh, one of the first things that uh, we have agreed to do through this declaration is to um, uh, agree a memorandum of understanding on uh, regulatory cooperate, cooperation uh, in the interest of um, uh, financial stability and market integrity and, uh, and uh, protection of consumers. So there's a commitment to achieve that by the end of, uh, end of March. Um, and meanwhile, we, um, we wait to see what the Commission has to say on, uh, on equivalence. Um, they have taken a couple of decisions before the end of the transition period. We, uh, we uh, took decisions on equivalence in about 17 areas. Um, I think the, the Commission has all the information it needs to uh, take a decision in the outstanding areas, and we hope that they will, will, we hope that they will do so soon. You said that the UK is happy to have no longer this uh legal framework of the EU to have its own sovereign rights in deciding on its laws. Mm -hmm. Do you <clears> expect <throat> in financial services that the UK will deviate a lot from the European rules? Because that is, of course, one of the main questions why equivalence has not yet been granted, or even in the future, that will determine whether the UK can uh, grant equivalence uh, in the areas where European directives provide uh, for such uh, right to do so? So, you know, as, as you know, um, EU law was um, converted into UK law. So from the 1st of January, we had the, uh, uh, the same rules in force. Clearly, we are going to, there is going to be divergence uh, in some sectors whether it's the EU changing its laws and us deciding not to follow, or whether it's us changing our laws. But what's very clear is that we're not going to be changing things just for the, for the sake of it. Um, you may be aware that we have uh, initiated a, a, few, uh, a few reviews uh, in different, different areas of, of financial services industry. They may lead to suggestions that it would be good for us to do X, Y, or Z in the interests of our economy, the interests of our financial services industry, and that may lead to, to legislative changes. But you know, our vision for uh, financial services industry in the UK in um, in the future. I mean, it's partly about sort of global partnerships. It's partly about making sure that we're at the forefront of, of innovation. But it's also about ensuring that we maintain the high regulatory standards, which is always 
been at the core of why London is an attractive place to do to do business. So there will be changes, yes, but this sort of you know image that occasionally people sort of lazily present about a Singapore on Thames is just not going to happen. Natalie, obviously, we now looked at these uh, topics, and especially the ambassador from uh, the public sector's viewpoint, those who negotiated uh, the treaty. Fidelity, of course, is uh, present everywhere. So um, what does this new treaty, and in particular the perspective for the coming years in the new world, is the UK outside the EU represent for a company like yours? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, to having Fidelity International on this very distinguished panel. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I guess that uh, in, in light of the political changes, um, the asset managers will have gotten ready by now. Um, they will have acquired uh, new licenses, new authorizations. Maybe they will have hired uh, more people on the continent to be ready from an operational perspective. And uh, for Fidelity International, it was more of an incremental step. Uh, because we have been, for example, based in Luxembourg uh, since about 30 years. And uh, we, we are based as well in about 15 uh, EU countries already, also for about three decades. Um, so depending uh, on the existing business model, um, it was more an incremental step, or for some it was fundamental change. Uh, but what I guess it means at a more industry-wide level um, is that the countries on the continent obviously have tried to build out a competitive advantage, fair enough. In Luxembourg, uh, which is known already for asset management, um, they're building on the, on the brand of the USITS, so the mutual funds. Um, it's the Luxembourg-based uh, um, USITS funds are the largest um, funds sold offshore. Um, so, likewise, other EU countries will try to um, attract more asset management business and we expect that there will be uh, more of a, a network of centers of excellence across uh, the continent. Um, but coming also to the UK, uh, where I believe uh, the UK has an opportunity uh, as a jurisdiction to build out uh, an advantage is truly in the implementation excellence of the regulation and in the speed in which they can go about it now being an individual jurisdiction. So, um, from an industry perspective, uh, rather than talking about or thinking about divergence of rules, um, it is, I think, in the interest of the end investor and to protect the end investor, to have as much regulatory um, convergence where possible. Um, after all, the UK was instrumental in designing the framework that we have in place right now. Um, so why and how much could these rules then differ? Mm. But of course, they will evolve. But we uh, hope as industry that they would evolve um, jointly. And all eyes of the asset managers are, of course, on the memorandum of understanding, the MOU between the UK and the EU, um, and truly hope uh, that there will be um, a bit more uh, information on financial services on it, uh, in it. Again, it's ultimately to the benefit of the end investor. And the UK, of course, has an opportunity now uh, to take the international stage with COP26. Um, they're hosting it in November this year. And I think in the, in the space of sustainable finance, um, there's also opportunity for convergence and specifically for this year, also on the G7 leadership uh, to stand out. But again, I think it should be a partnership approach at the public sector level. And this is what the private sector asset managers are hoping for. Thank you. And indeed, I, I witnessed uh, very often how instrumental the United Kingdom was in influencing the shaping of EU law and financial services. That's why it is even more difficult for many citizens on the continent, including myself, to understand why they left uh, the European Union, because obviously in the future, those rules on the continent will be shaped without the presence of the United Kingdom maybe in cooperation with the United Kingdom, but certainly in a different setting than we were used to do that over the past uh, 50 years when the United Kingdom was sitting at the table of uh, the European institutions. Um, Jervis, um, maybe in uh, building on what uh, Natalie just said, you are in the 
corporate services, um, investment fund services uh, segment. You are present also in many countries. Mm. Will you grow your business on the continent in light of the fact that um, the British left a little bit more to the north of Europe? Maybe. Um, no, thank you very much, Luke, and I'd echo Natalie's uh, thanks for having us here. Um, Vistra, in its more modest way, not as uh, uh, global as Fidelity, but we're, we're in 46 countries around the world, and we effectively have two businesses, one which we'll talk about when we talk about the US, which is our corporate relocation business, where we take companies international, uh, internationally. Um, the, the one that really is relevant to this conversation, of course, is our fund administration business. But unlike Fidelity, which, although it has alternatives, is really focused on that sort of um, traditional asset management of, of liquid securities, our fund administration business is really around real assets. So real estate, private equity, infrastructure, private debt, those type of uh, asset classes. And I think that's a more interesting argument about whether the UK can separate itself from the EU. Um, there's, there's a bit more nimbleness, if you like, and the rigid uh, control over the alternative investments industry, which came in as a result of the famous financial crisis, and particularly the bizarre activities of Mr. Madoff uh, in the United States, um, that, that complexity of structure that came in through AIFMD, which was a European directive, although heavily influenced by the British, as you say, uh, I think that that's points to some of the flexibility that maybe the, the pursuit of a global Britain, which was a bit unlucky if you think about it in its timing, because in 2016, the idea that Britain could be sort of independent from the EU and set about itself going around its business and making partnerships all over the world was a pre-COVID environment. It was a pre-populist movement environment. Uh, and now, as we, we may find when we talk about the US elections, you're into a much more isolationist environment. So I think the jury's out as to whether we can get equivalence. I mean, equivalence would be the obvious thing to do right now. Until five minutes ago, the UK was part of Europe. So of course their system is equivalent. But if it wants to develop, and we've seen some early signs of setting itself up as a fund center, a bit like Cayman or Jersey, for alternative investments is quite plausible for a much more respectable uh, jurisdiction in terms of the talent pool that the London has, then there's a possibility. But it, it's, it's very early to say. All I can say is that on behalf of my clients, you know, navigating <clears throat> these choppy waters is, is a significant challenge going forward. And, and that's good for business because Vistra is going to be helping them do that. So where there's a threat, there's also an opportunity. Thank you, Jerry. Then before turning to Casey and getting the view from the other side of the uh, ocean, maybe uh, one more question to, to John. Obviously, a lot of um, companies uh, like Fidelity Vistra and those uh, watching us, they have people working on both sides of the channel and they will continue uh, to visit, of course, London. I think uh, that's one thing, but maybe also sending people there to work and for, for several years and those uh, and the other way around as well. You know, there's a, a big community, a British community in Luxembourg and in other European jurisdictions. So could you give us, without going into technical details, how do you see the future working relationship? There's no more free movement of EU citizens as we were used to have. So how do you expect this? How difficult will this be for private companies to move people from, say, Luxembourg um, uh, to London and vice versa? So the first thing to say is that, you know, we will want to um, keep the UK attractive to international talent, whether it's in the financial services sector or whatever it might, might be. And we put in place a new immigration uh, policy, a points-based um, immigration system that will, that will deliver that. So, you know, if, if uh, a bank in, in, in Luxembourg uh, wants to make a job offer to uh, someone in, sorry, a bank in the UK wants to make a job offer to, uh, to someone in, in, in Luxembourg. Um, I'm, I'm sure that is not going to present any difficulties uh, what, whatsoever. Um, when it comes to short term uh, visits, um, you can visit uh, the UK for up to six months uh, without uh, a visa uh, of any sort. 
um, whether that's for a tourist visit or whether it's uh, for business meetings to attend conferences. So a lot of the kind of the normal traffic between um, Luxembourg and the UK would be uh, allowed under those rules. When it comes to um, intra-company uh, transfers uh, within the trade and cooperation agreement, uh, that is um, that is allowed with uh, different periods of time, depending on whether you are a trainee or a, uh, or a manager. So my expectation is that the sort of interaction that has traditionally existed between our two financial sectors uh, will go on largely as before. There may be some additional processes, for example, applying for a visa if you're going to be going to the UK for uh, longer than six months, but uh, nothing that is um, going to present a, an obstacle uh, to that sort of close close working. Well, that's good news. That's good to hear. Let's hope that it works out uh, like that. But certainly uh, hearing from you, the willingness that it will work in that way uh, is there. And um, I think that's very important as we count on a close partnership indeed between our two financial centers as we have had in the past. Um, Casey, I realized that... Um, the first phone call that the new American president made to European counterparts was, if I'm not mistaken, to Boris Johnson, uh, the British uh, Prime Minister. Does that mean that um, the new US administration will give a preferential treatment to the um, United Kingdom? And more generally, how do you expect the new American administration to be to what will be its attitude towards uh, Europe, taking into account also that uh, the new Secretary of State speaks French, that he has spent some time in France. All this, of course, has an influence on, on people's way to act, but obviously the policy is determined by uh, the president. So special relationship with the UK, maybe a free trade agreement with the UK, and what does that mean for the rest of the European Union? Well, thanks, Luke. It's, um... It's clear we're only 30 days into the new administration, but they are off to a roaring start at staking out the priorities that they want to, uh, they want to approach in this new administration and the principles by which they are going to conduct um, the, the business of government over the next four years. One of the principles that's loud and clear is their strong commitment to American leadership on the world stage. And both the president and the new secretary of state and indeed the entire team he's assembled um, behind him are, are veterans of, most of them are veterans of government, veterans of international engagement. And all of them have been saying repeatedly that um, they're, they want America back, uh, rebuilding alliances. Um, they've they've uh, talked about how important alliances are to the United States to our economic prosperity, but also to our national security, um, engagement with multilateral institutions. Uh, there's a strong commitment to the transatlantic relationship. Um, of course, the, the special relationship with the UK on one hand, but the, the European Union and the continent on the other. And um, when it comes time to start to uh, negotiate trade arrangements with the UK and the European Union, our hope is that Brexit will maybe have worn down the negotiators from both sides, so it's easier to reach agreement <laughs> with the United States, or, or it might have sharpened their, their skills. But, um, but the president and the U.S. administration, at least initially, is focused on, on uh, the American economy and strengthening the American economy and, and as it tries to overcome the crisis of the COVID pandemic and has already set... Um, out an, an ambitious plan to reinvest in the American economy that should help us, um, you know, enter this next phase in a stronger position. When you look at financial services, uh, obviously in, in the theory, in the political theory, Democrats and Republicans stand for a different attitude towards uh, big corporations, uh, banks, and so on. Now knowing that um, the new president... Um, has a long experience and is, uh, to some extent, a real politica. He has been a senator for Delaware, which is uh, a quite attractive jurisdiction when it comes to corporate law in the United States. So where do you see, also on the basis of what you have 
seen over the past few months in the campaign and in the first uh, actions, the first appointments by the new president. Where do you see this administration standing on the global uh, regulatory agenda when it comes to financial services? Well, I don't actually don't think it's been a, uh, at the foremost of the national conversation. <laughs> and, um, but I do think that some of the priorities that they've outlined initially will have great implications for financial services internationally. Certainly climate uh, among them being a very strong focus for this new administration should create lots of opportunities for the financial services industry in the, in the coming years. The, the new administration is committed to this very ambitious domestic and international approach to, to climate change that I think will we'll start to see a lot of strong policy signals out of Washington that will create probably a lot of new attractive investment opportunities. Um, there's a commitment to start to, to organize ourselves for um, doing more international finance to emerging and developing economies. Uh, I think there's partnership opportunities with the financial services industry there as well. So um, to, the financial services, financial service in the, in the United States is an important sector in our economy. And, and they will, as we, as we start to um, define in sharper terms, our agenda in terms of our, our trade agenda internationally, they financial services will feature prominently, but um, a lot of those uh, details are still to be worked out. But, but I think you're right that there's a, there are some things to fix first and, you know, if you think about it, compared to the financial crisis that you referenced earlier on, he's coming in, Biden's coming in uh, with the COVID crisis and, you know, an enormous uh, uh, budget deficit. And, and he's got to steer a, a dangerous course between the scylla of the, the right-wing mob, uh, you know, to, to use a, a word that was used about the storming of the capital that bunch of people who, let's face it, still represented, you know, a very large number of people. They might not have won the election, but 70 million people voted for Trump, and you can't forget about them. And the Charybdis of the, of the Bernie Sanders brigade on, in his own party. So he's got to steer this course between the, the Scylla and Charybdis of those two extremes. And, you know, luckily he is so experienced, because who, who would want that? But the early signs are this curious mix of sort of great, U.S. protectionism, saying you've got to buy American and, and, and encouraging that. And, and then the, the sort of uh, climate and, and ESG aspect. So, so I've been telling my son, who is a U.S. citizen, by the way, that he ought to be um, uh, an American electric vehicle manufacturer. And that, there's no wonder in my mind that Tesla's price is through the roof. And so are the lithium battery companies and everybody. They're, they're all jumping up and the stock prices have doubled. Yeah. Natalie, you, you come from a company whose headquarter is in the United States, is in Fidelity based in, in... Actually, it's our sister entity, Fidelity sister entity. Investments, it has the base... But you're obviously the sister entity, you are strong in the United States. Absolutely. So that, how does a company like yours view this, um, the beginning of this um, new administration in the United States? What does that mean for a company like yours, but more generally, obviously, for the fund industry, which, as I said at the very beginning, mm -hmm. that is global by nature. Uh, what does it mean for the fund industry, for the asset management industry? Yes, absolutely. So I think for the asset management industry, it very much means that we would expect that sustainable finance would move up straight to the top of the agenda as a key priority. And um, we have also um, we welcome that uh, the new administration have signed the Paris Accord, so that, um, that they joined the international community on that. And um, we very much hope that the United States would also join the European Union International Platform on Sustainable Finance. Mm. And I guess uh, this will be reviewed um, soon. And it's uh, very positive that the UK has already signed up uh, to it only last week, officially. Um, HMT have announced that they would join it because um, we can only reach um, what the people, the citizens voted to reach in terms of climate change if we act on an international level. And of course, um, we have also large Asian uh, countries that are part of the platform, like China and India. And from an asset manager perspective, it's really helpful if we have also here international global standards, 
with regards to the definition of what is ESG. For example, the EU have developed a taxonomy. Hopefully, uh, the international community can build on that. Um, but also with regards to the duties of asset managers. Um, and also, thirdly, with regards to uh, corporate disclosure. Um, we uh, very much support um, that there are international sets, that they converge and that there will not be individual approaches taken by individual countries or individual regions. And um, what is also important, and I guess this will come uh, very strongly with the new US administration, is um, there is more and more an insight, um, one, that there is a correlation between financial and non-financial performance, um, but secondly, this connection between climate and social factors. Mm -hmm. So in asset management, we very much see the rise of the S factor. And in the US, I think the term uh, climate equity or climate equality is used for that quite frequently because um, about 80% of the CO2 or the GHG emissions come from about only 20% of the population. And if the new Biden administration will focus on emerging markets, then this will be critical as well because uh, they will be most affected by climate change. And hence, from an asset manager perspective, it's very important to in include these factors in the investment process, but also in the distribution process when engaging with our clients. Thank you. <clears throat> John, obviously, you are not in the US, you are no longer in the EU, you are in between as representative of the United Kingdom. Will you look more in the future when it comes to the economy towards the US as the old slash new ally or towards the European Union? And um, more generally, what do you think will be on the common agenda uh, of the US slash Europe in the years um, to come under the Biden administration. So um, we're very much looking forward to working with um, uh, President Biden and his administration. I mean, there were some people who thought that because, you know, my prime minister um, had a good relationship with uh, President Trump and foreign secretary had a good relationship with Secretary Pompeo, that somehow it'd be hard for us to um, have a good relationship with uh, the incoming administration. But, you know, basically the US are incredibly important partners for us. So, um, you know, it's one of the foremost priorities of any British prior prime minister to have a good relationship with his, um, with his US opposite number, with the US president. Um, and uh, it was a good, uh, good relationship, but also there were many areas uh, of policy where we had fundamental uh, disagreements, uh, whether it's on uh, climate change or transatlantic trade or uh, Iran, uh, etc. And um, with the Biden administration, we're looking forward to um, a really close partnership in, in, in some areas uh, where perhaps uh, the contact has been a little bit less in recent years. And, you know, a primary example, as already referred to by, by Natalie, is uh, climate change. Um, as Natalie says, we're hosting COP26, the uh, conference of the parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Glasgow in, in, in November. Uh, and the whole purpose of that, uh, um, of that meeting is to deliver on the ambition of the Paris Agreement. And so it's fantastic that one of the first uh, acts that President Biden took uh, was to, um, uh, to rejoin, for the US to rejoin uh, the Paris Agreement. Um, but there'd be so many other areas. I mean, one of the other first phone calls that he made was to the Secretary General of, of, of NATO. So we look forward to working very closely with the US within uh, NATO. Um, the U.S. is now re-engaging with uh, the World Health Organization, uh, with the Human Rights uh, Council. So these are all sort of tangible examples of the commitment to, uh, you know, investing in alliances into a sort of, you know, uh, uh, into multilateralism. And um, I think it's going to be a very good uh, period uh, of partnership between the U.K. Uh, and the US, but there will also be many things that we as the UK do together with the EU and uh, the US because, you know, the three of us sort of share values, share interests, and it makes sense for us to be uh, working together in all these, all these fields. But climate change really is the 
uh, one of the biggest challenges for this year. Certainly, it's our top international priority for 2021. And Luke, as a Luxembourger, you'll know that Luxembourg is a big player in the in the whole climate change uh, game, particularly in financial services with all the green bonds that are listed on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. I think all of this is mm -hmm. is very relevant to this country uh, as well as to the broader EU. So it's a fantastic step forward. Yes, and in That's the same right. way, of course, building on what John just said, I think there's there are a lot of these issues, uh, including. <clears throat> The external security dimension, where Luxembourg is a member of NATO, where indeed the US, uh, the UK, um, and Luxembourg, as well as other European partners, will continue to work closely together. So, mm. and that goes obviously beyond the trade and cooperation agreement that we touched upon in the context of uh, Brexit. But before, uh, as time goes on, and uh, before moving maybe to some of the regulatory agendas, maybe an, a question of less to, to Casey. Casey, I, th I think you worked, you used to work um, in, in the past few years, uh, also in the White House, and you saw uh, the now president uh, working there as a vice president. Could you just give us um, not a political assessment, but an, a human assessment of uh, the kind of uh, leadership that we can expect from a man that uh, you saw in his, uh, uh, in his daily workings when he was vice president under President Obama? What kind of person is he and what do we, can we expect in his leadership style? Well, I think um, certainly one of the images that's caught on over the last two months is the compassion that he wears on his sleeve. Um, and uh, and he, he, has, he, is a very, he has a very human uh, touch with the people he meets with and connects, has a very strong human connection. Um, you know, in contrast, the, the, the President Obama, very cerebral, um, President, now President Biden, uh, very sort of dynamic and personable. And, but, but as you mentioned also, just wealth of, of decades of experience working on international affairs, um, in government, uh, you know, tackling some of the hardest challenges that, that the transatlantic uh, relationship and partners have faced over the last 40 years. So uh, w the, the context is new and different and the, the challenges are <laughs> no smaller than they were before and quite, in fact, they're quite large, but um, he's, he's committed to, the, to this, uh, you know, approaching problems and solving problems with, with partners, with, um, whether it's in the United States across the aisle uh, or whether it's internationally with our, with our partners and our allies. And, you know, the, we haven't talked about Asia, but that, that indeed is another area of opportunity and challenge for, the, um, for our economic uh, actors in our countries or, and geopolitically as well. But um, I think we can uh, appreciate that the president President is going to approach Asia in the same way is, is using um, and working with our partners to construct a, a strong international system of rules, uh, uh, predictability for. Yeah. Which obviously from a European perspective is um, extremely uh, important. And I think if I listen to this panel here tonight, uh, we all express the view that we have to work together and mm -hmm. uh, both the private sector and the representatives of uh, the countries that are here around the table. So I think that should give us uh, hope and a positive spirit, despite the difficult economic uh, and health environment that we are uh, in. But there are other topics where obviously we have to work um, together to make the, the world a, a better place. But um, obviously in Europe, but in relation to third countries in the asset management industry, the issue of delegation is high on the agenda. And although that might be now uh, a technical topic to talk about that uh, late in the evening, but maybe just a few words about, about this. Do we need a change there? In particular, is, will the, the delegation to countries such as the UK, such as the US in the future still be possible? Should it be possible? And I think maybe briefly, Natalie, uh, on that issue as it might interest some of our viewers. 
Absolutely, and uh, delegation is a model um, on which the entire asset management industry is based. Um, it's worked uh, extremely well so far, um, and we do have at the global level a network um, of international um, financial centers. Um, so again, to open for end investors the opportunity, uh, the, the largest possible opportunity in terms of investment opportunities uh, and risk diversification, we strongly support to maintain the current global delegation model. Um, if um, there's anything is, of course, to enhance the um, cooperation of the regulators amongst each other, because um, as industry, we already report uh, not just to the local uh, regulators, but also to the EU level regulators, and we are in close contact and, and exchange of views um, with global standard setters, of course. Um, so in that sense, it's a proven model, um, and we hope to maintain it. Travis, would you like to yeah, add something I mean, there? I, I, I mean, I think it, it's very hard to predict the future, but I think one of the, there's a question that's coming up on the site of the, of the screen at the moment about what, what is the, going to have the biggest impact in the next couple of years. I mean, you have to take COVID in, and, and the impact of COVID into account with things like delegation. I mean, it, it is a bit loony in this day and age that where people can operate from home, wherever that may be, or from a hotel room if they're put in quarantine for two or three weeks, to say that something has to be done in a particular place is, is, is a little out of date, you know, and, and I think that because don't forget the regulators only enforce what politicians pass as laws. I think the politicians are going to be very influential in this, and this is why the, the topic of these, these political uh, affairs are so important, because delegation today may be completely out of date in five years' time, if, if COVID has an impact on remote working and, and uh, the, the protectionism that's coming in. Look what's happened with the accidental vaccine uh, for Rory a couple of weeks ago, this, this is all indicating that people are look, sort of looking after number one. Well, in the asset management industry, that, that doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's, it's not a parochial business. It is a global, global business. So I think it's going to be tough to be uh, isolationist in the asset management industry. Hmm. And I think not only in, the, in that industry, in general, I think isolationist, being isolated is uh, never, uh, in my view, the way, the way to, to move forward. Now we are faced with a lot of challenges uh, and we discussed some of them uh, today, I think in a rather positive uh, manner. Uh, there's some perspective there. We forgot almost uh, COVID during this um, hour, if you wouldn't have <laughs> talked about it at the end. Uh, we all hope that through the vaccines that will be over in uh, later this, uh, this year. But maybe to, to close, and a word from, from each one of you, if you look two to three years ahead, where do you think that the biggest uh, impact on this industry, on financial services in general, uh, will be? If you take the new US administration, the new UK, as I call it, outside the European Union, and uh, the pandemic, where do you think are the biggest opportunities, if you can say it in one or two words. And maybe I would go around, John, starting with you. I'm not sure I can choose between the three, but I think what I would choose to say, uh, given the sort of, you know, the five years of, 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 of Brexit that I've, that I've lived through, is that I am most excited to see what we as the UK do with this freedom of action that we have now in the financial services sector uh, and, uh, and in other sectors. And it'll be fascinating to, uh, to watch, to see what we choose to do with that freedom of action and see, uh, see what that means for our uh, financial services sector. But I'm very confident about its future. And I would like to thank you for, as your term as ambassador in Luxembourg comes to an end, to say that you have been a great representative of your country and you have always engaged in strengthening this partnership between the UK and Luxembourg. We hope that that will continue independent of, um, of uh, Brexit, of course, in the future. So thank sure you very will. much. Thank, thank you. you very much for that, uh, John. Yeah, 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 yeah. Natalie? 
So I think for the asset management industry, um, the most uh, transformational change will be on ESG. Um, and I think what is most important here is the, the engagement with the corporates that we invest in um, and to help them transition. So overall, the, the shift towards a more responsible form of capitalism, I think, will be the biggest change over the next one to two years. Jervis? I was going to say the same as Natalie, so I'll say uh, <laughs> tax. I think tax is still an issue uh, for, the, for the world, but I think that if we've got administrations that are, are broad-minded, uh, we've got the European Union setting an example, uh, I think that we can start to get to a, a place where taxation is uh, more stable uh, and, and, and more equalized across, across the world. And last but not least, Casey. Should I say GameStop, or would that be the wrong thing to say? No, I, I, as the American diplomat, I think I have to say the, American, the new administration. Um, but, but really, as it approaches the, the COVID pandemic, because there is still so much uh, economic rebuilding that we need to do in the United States and Europe and to recover. I mean, there's a recovery process that we have to that we are all hoping will be very fast, but I think it's still too early to say how long that process will last, and, and that will have obviously some major implications for our economies going forward. Thank you very much for that, and thank you to all the co-panelists for this uh, very interesting exchange of uh, views. Mm -hmm.